Hey guys, it is May 28th, um, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I wanted to take you to a tweet that I put out um, earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, it says Minneapolis is apparently falling apart, right? Uh, the riots and the looting, and since Minnesota shares one bureaucracy and economy with six other states, change is afoot. So the Target and the police department that were vandalized were most likely going to go away anyway. And that is because of this message here, this tweet here from Cranes Chicago. And this was from about a month ago, where it says the governors of Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, and Kentucky are officially signing on to a multi-state pact to coordinate strategies for the economy. So, and of course, everything is done under the guise of safety and COVID and all that. But these kinds of policies and these kinds of initiatives have been um, planned for a very long time. So what multi-state coalitions are is they are clumps of states. And in this particular case, these seven states that you see listed here on the screen make up the Midwestern Coalition. We'll call it the Midwestern Coalition, and Minnesota is included in that. So a lot of the riots and a lot of the um, vandalism that you're seeing um, you know, coming through the mainstream media, that, like, for instance, the police station that, um, that went, you know, that was vandalized and the target that was looted, those probably were going to go away anyway, because what we're looking at is a coalition of states, a multi-state coalition that will share one economy and one bureaucracy. So there's a good chance that the um, there's going to be parts of each state listed here that some businesses may never open again. A uh, job loss will be, you know, at record rates. Uh, hospitals will shut down. The police force will probably become eventually become like maybe a regional police force. So that means there's going to be a lot of, of um, different types of people throughout these seven states, this one coalition that will be out of work and out of a job. So, you know, it's really important to understand that there's always a little more to the story than your emotional reaction to it. I realize that it's a very tragic incident that took place and people are angry as well they should be. But there's also this other story going on. There's this background stuff going on that no one's talking about. Um, Multi-state coalitions are made up of unelected committee members. They have, uh, um, they're considered stakeholders in uh, corporate enterprises or corporate entities or corporate interests. And these committees and stakeholders were not voted into place. It's not like they're your county representative or your commissioner or anything like that. They're just um, people who are doing the, uh, they're, they're putting all of the right models in place to support corporate governance. Um, and corporate governance, when you have businesses and corporations working together, um, it's uh, corporate fascism is what it is. So obviously we're at my Twitter page. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. That's me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. But in regards to the, the Minneapolis story, I did want to take you to a channel that I think you would probably benefit from. Um, this friend of mine who lives in Florida has his own YouTube channel as well. 
And he, as you can see, I listened to about half of this video so far, and I said, I've got to stop and do a little video on my own, and I'd like to have you guys, I'd like to direct you over to this video. Um, Agent Provocateur Setting Fires in Minneapolis. So, I think that this will give you some more depth about what's going on with the riots in Minneapolis and the fires and, and all the vandalism and things like that. I know I get a lot about it. I get a lot out of these videos that he, um, that he does. So I think you should go there and take a look at that video as well. But what I would like to do is go back to this idea of the multi-state coalitions. Um, where they share one bureaucracy and one economy. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about the kind of people that are on these committees. Now, whether they are aware of their role in corporate fascism or not, I don't know. Um, I don't think they're thinking in those terms. I don't believe that they're thinking in, in a broader sense the way I do. So the kind of people that make up these coalitions and these c committees that are not voted into place they're just selected handpicked and thrown into their positions and they're usually very well paid and they're usually um, people that you probably really like and you could probably kind of like relate to um, but they're definitely very well paid and what they do is they make decisions for large swaths of the population and the population is not aware that these people who are selected not voted in but selected to make these giant decisions about your bureaucracy and your economy maybe how your um, city and your county is run maybe your public transportation uh, system maybe the way it's run I mean they make these very very important decisions about how your life and your quality of life will be affected without your knowledge, without your input. Um, and so that's not a democracy. Um, so if you go back to my original um, tutorial, which was from about a week ago, I talked to you about how on March 13th, Friday the 13th, Donald Trump basically um, ended uh, you know, the America as we know it, <laughs> you can go back and watch this tutorial and I can kind of take you through the steps, you know, from March 13th when he first called for a national emergency and then a week later he met with FEMA and, and then FEMA drew up a plan on how to, quote, reopen the country and it had to do with business interests and corporate interests and that took you to the World Economic Forum. So, you know, I tried to take you along, you know, step by step by step to show you where we are now. This is a good one to watch to, you know, just for a reference. The new model is a good one to watch as well. And then if you want to learn about something called sustainable development, um, you should lo look at social equity. So going back to multi-state coalitions, multi-state coalitions and the committees that uh, that make up the multi-state coalitions that are always under the governors of each state. Um, they are implementing models that are put out under something called sustainable, sustainable development, which is the equivalent of corporate fascism. It's basically where corporations, there's a lot of feel-good language and a lot of, you know, so-called, you know, up with community and up with the green um ecology and, and things like that. There's a lot of this feel-good language, but ultimately what it comes down to is who benefits. And I can tell you who doesn't benefit, um, you don't benefit. The little guy doesn't benefit. So these people that make up these committees that work on behalf of corporate interests to model out sustainable development models for your um, for your regions, and in this particular case, um, the seven states here, they're made up of the managerial class. And the managerial elite um, work on behalf of the ruling class. And there's a really good 
interview with Brendan O'Neill, um, Michael Lind wrote a book. And the book is literally called The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward this to about three minutes into it. And I'm going to let you listen to what he has to say about the managerial elite and their role and who they are. Um, and then hopefully that will give you some idea about, you know, multi-state coalitions, the kind of people that are selected to run the committees it, within each coalition. There are many coalitions um, throughout the United States. I live in the Eastern Coalition, which makes up Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, uh, Delaware, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. So there's seven there. Um, my home state, which is California, they also are in a coalition. They're the West Coast Coalition or the West Coalition. They make up um, California, Oregon, and Washington. And just to, to once again remind you that each coalition is made up of committees and stakeholders who work on behalf of corporate interests. They don't work on behalf of the people. We don't have a functioning democracy anymore. It, everything is based on sustainable development models, and that is a very pretty, very beige way of describing corporate fascism. So what I'm going to do is let you listen to Michael Lind talk to Brendan O'Neill for just a couple of minutes, not for very long, um, and then we'll move on. The first thing I want to ask you about is the greatest threat to Western democracy, because if you were to ask the average liberal, or if you were to go to a dinner party somewhere in London or New York and ask people what they thought was the greatest threat to Western democracy, they'd probably say Trump, they might say Brexit, they might say neo-fascism, but you have argued that the greatest threat to Western democracy actually comes from the well-educated, well-mannered and well-funded centrist neoliberal political class that we have lived under for a period of time. That would strike some people as a surprising answer. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, my argument in my book, uh, The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite, is that Western societies at this point, although formally democratic, are actually oligarchic in structure. And the oligarchy is what James Burnham in the mid-20th century called the managerial class, which he and I define broadly to include a college-educated elite in the uh, public service and in the nonprofit sector, as well as in the private sector, like corporate executives. This is a class which in the United States, if you define it most broadly as people with undergraduate bachelor's degrees, it's no more than 30% of the population. If you define it a bit more accurately, postgraduate and professional degrees, that's about 10% of the population. So you have 10% of the population supplies the uh, leadership in the business sector, in journalism, in government, in the nonprofit sector, almost exclusively. And I also argue that the agenda and the uh, policies of Western democracies reflect the class interests of this group. Um. Yeah, let's recap what Michael Lind said. He said that about 10% of the population, which is this managerial class or this managerial elite, they are the ones that are making the decisions, um, making some very important decisions for large swaths of the population. Millions of people's lives will be affected by the decisions that this managerial elite make. And they it is not up to debate, um, and nor is there any transparency in these decisions. It's just one day you wake up and the rules have changed, or there's been updates to whatever system that you're, you're in. So these people, they... Um, 
They're in charge of everything from food distribution to technology to your local transportation system uh, to your educational uh, system. Okay, this is these are the uh, managerial class that work on behalf of the ruling class or work on behalf of sustainable development measures. And these measures and models come right out of uh, the World Economic Forum, and this is globalization. So when you're looking at the attempt to globalize or introduce globalization to a country, you can't just go to the United States as a whole, all 50 states, and say, guess what, you're just part of you know the EU now. What you have to do is you have to tackle it region by region, and so that's why we have these new um, models so that regionalization can happen. So it's ultimately going to be global, regional, and then local. That's the, that's the hierarchy. And unfortunately, this will be um, a model where it will ultimately transition into sort of a surf um, aristocrat relationship. So children now don't have a future. Well, nobody has a future now, obviously. So, and the, there are committees and, and stakeholders that are invested in, in this, these sustainable development models that will create, you know, a huge disparity of um, access to life, um, love the life that you're used to, that are putting models in place to keep certain members of the population, most of the population, from having access to that. So, you know, this is what's happening. I mean, this just, I have no opinion about this. I'm just simply telling you that this is what's happening. One of the, um, uh, one of the, 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 uh, the, the mechanisms by which sustainable development models can be put into place is through your transportation agency. In order to implement certain aspects of sus sustainable development, which is surveillance, you need to have a regionalized transportation agency. That means that transportation agencies that... Um, had a local um, way of doing things. Like, for instance, in Los Angeles, the transportation agency there uh, worked on behalf of the Los Angeles commuting um, public, Los Angeles commuters, um, public transit commuters, specifically in Los Angeles, because Los Angeles commuters are a different type of demographic than, say, San Francisco commuters. So each transit agency throughout the country um, in the past has developed systems that work for their specific demographics, and they take a lot of time to learn about the different types of neighborhoods and regions and things like that that would take public trans, and then they base their systems on that. Well, what regionalization, for instance, I'm just using public transit as, a, as an example right now, but what regionalization does is it kind of does this overarching sweep and says, okay, all of Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, Indiana, and Kentucky will now be under one regionalized transit system, so to speak. Now, each little transit card might look a little bit different, but ultimately it will be that regionalization, that sustainable development model, which of course the goal with sustainable development is surveillance. Like this is the, this is sort of the end game goal, surveillance and capture of, um, of human capital. So human capital is where everything that you do and everything that you are and everything that you say even down to your bio data, um, is captured, you know, and, and funneled back into sustainable development models so that these types of systems and the people who run these systems can make lots of money. You are now the, the thing that which is mined for 
the um, the benefit of, of these systems. So it's a little bit complicated, and I know it's hard for people to quite grasp. It's a com- you know nobody wants to admit that they're now a slave as opposed to being an autonomous human being with sovereignty and control over yourself and your life, and also that your privacy is completely gone. So um, one example of these um, of public transportation in particular is c- comes out of San Francisco. Um, and I just, you know, I happened to catch a town hall meeting with uh, Scott Weiner, who is a politician in San Francisco. And various heads of different transit agencies um, got together and uh, did sort of a town hall. What I've done is I've captured a couple of different uh, segments of the video, and I want to just go over them and help you to see the, um, you know, the language. So these are, these people right here are the, um, the managerial class, the managerial elite that Michael Lind just talked about. These are the people, these seven people who are in this town hall meeting which is put on by this guy here, Senator Scott Wiener, um, to talk about the future of transportation in a COVID world, right? So these people are making decisions for millions of people in the Bay Area. And you don't have a say in the, the things that they, you know, the models that they implement. You don't really have a say in what they come up with. So these people are installed and selected, and they make radical decisions. And in this particular case, it's regarding public transportation. Um, In other cases, it could be regarding food distribution or education for your child. But in this particular case, it's regarding public transportation. So what I've done is I've captured the video and I've bookmarked a couple of different spots that I want to um, translate for you because there's a lot of corporate speak in here. And, you know, people who have not, who don't come from a corporate background and, you know, I was in the corporate world for a little while, so I kind of get the duplicity and, you know, the language and I know kind of how to read between the lines. Um, so let's go to the first part I wanted to play for you. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of sad that these kinds of decisions are being made without public input. And that's really the, the point I want to drive home with the, this, is that there are seven people who are literally making these really intense decisions about sustainable development models for regional transportation which you know always goes back to surveillance and human capital, um, creating human capital and maintaining human capital. And a month later, the mayor issued her emergency order, and a month after that was shelter in place. Um, And since then, uh, our primary focus uh, has been protecting the health and safety of our workforce and of the public. Um, And thanks to the uh, quick action by Mayor London Breed, Um, and the health directors of all the Bay Area counties, um, we are probably um, having the lowest COVID transmission rate of any large transit agency in the United States. Did you catch that? The part where he talked about health records, health data for the Bay Area? What? Okay, so right there, you have to be able to really listen to when these people talk. So apparently he got access to, I guess, public health records. And so what the hell does that mean? Does that mean that he suddenly has, you know, all the, all the public health records for everybody in the Bay Area? How does he have permission for that? Yeah, I know in some cases health records are public anyway, Um, 
but I guess this is what I'm trying to say is that these are these kinds of decisions are being made without you understanding um, the gravity of it. We don't, if we lived in a functioning democracy, you would have received some kind of notice. Maybe everybody in the Bay Area did. I'm not living in the Bay Area anymore, so maybe I'm speaking out of turn. But apparently, um, he had access to all of the public health records of everyone in the Bay Area. And that is how they were able to implement whatever they needed to do. Um, so, you know, he mentioned before, and, you know, you can go back and watch this video if you want. Um, it's public. It's it's no secret. It's, it's on the Swiftly team um, YouTube page. And you see 171 views. That's all me, because when I started watching it, and I've been sort of parsing through it, it only had like nine views. I'm not kidding. I've been going back and listening to this, and I'm just, I'm severely, like seriously appalled by by some of the things that I'm hearing. Um, and the first thing that really just appalled me and kind of floored me was that this guy who was in his position as one of these managerial elite types and these managerial class who's making decisions for millions of people in the Bay Area, suddenly he was able to just get everybody's health records. That's really strange to me, and nobody knew. So this is, and his team did. So that's a, that's a red flag. I mean, that should be a red flag to everybody. And I just, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some sort of corporate like if anybody was ever to come back to me and say, oh, well, you know, Julie, we this and that, and we, we did everything right and we were within the letter of the law, it's like I don't really care. Health records should really be private. And they unless you sign off on something and you didn't know you were signing off your health records to, you know, one person who's going to change, drastically change the lives of millions of people, so to me, this is a red flag. All right, so um, so those are the kind of things that you need to ask yourself. Um, let's see, moving on to the next section. He um, talks a little bit more about the funding and, and this kind of language. So I'm going to let you listen to this part for about a minute or so. Um, I had the deep pain of eliminating three quarters of muni lines mm -hmm. in one weekend um, and throwing all of our resources at the 13 lines that carried our greatest number of riders that served uh, all of our hospitals and other critical institutions um, and that provided the most possible service to the neighborhoods where people had the fewest choices. Um, we're now in the recovery period, um, but of course, all of our sources of revenue are down by uh, mostly 80 to 100%. Uh, Muni is heavily funded by parking fees, which are down to zero, by transit fares, which are effectively down to zero, uh, and a variety of other sources of revenue, like the hotel tax, which is down to nearly zero. Um, so it will be years before Muni is fully operational again given the severity of the financial catastrophe that is following the health catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, the, the CARES Act um, has helped a lot. It has helped us to avoid catastrophic layoffs, uh, at least for this fiscal year uh, and hopefully next, um, but it will mean a big contraction um, of service. At the same time, we know we play an absolutely essential role in supporting the economic recovery. Economic recovery cannot happen without transit. Economic recovery cannot happen without transit. You must be able to translate what that really means. He talked about how it's going to take years before the transit agencies are back to normal. And I would like to tell you that this taking down of many, many, many lines in order to keep just a few open those few, those 13, I think it was that he mentioned, are probably undergoing some radical changes right now, like 
maybe they're putting in uh, you know much more detailed surveillance um, I've talked repeatedly about how facial recognition software which you would always find in a store or whatever or you know oftentimes on transit agencies anyway is now outdated and there's software being developed that can you know capture your body's movements capture how many um, breaths per minute you take you can wear a mask, but they can still recognize you based on the shape of your body and the shape of your head, how many pores you have in your skin, the color of your eyes. So there's a good chance that the reason that they had to shut down a majority of the, um, the train lines and the bus lines in San Francisco and only keep, keep a few core open is because those core lines are getting... The software upgrade that they need in order to develop these sustainable development models, which is all about, again, all about surveillance and human capital. Um, so that that is, and he says, you know, right here, and this is a this is a a message that is repeated fairly often throughout this hour-long town hall, which is that, you know, you can't open up your economy or you can't have whatever it is that they want, which is, you know, a working economy until transit is in place because transit is key for, um, you know, facial rec recognition software, for body recognition software. For surveillance transit is key for that okay so it's going to be it's an absolute necessity if you want to implement sustainable development I, you know I should add that I am a huge fan of public transportation I choose public transportation over having a car because a car is cumbersome and expensive I can't afford the, the upkeep I don't feel comfortable behind the wheel of a car because that's a lot of tons of steel and metal and they're dangerous. People don't know how to drive anymore. You know, the insurance is always expensive. You know, there's always these, you know, things that you need to worry about. So I just don't even worry about it and I just take public transportation. And there's a certain freedom in that, in my opinion. I look at public transportation as a very freeing experience where I had sovereignty and autonomy over where I wanted to go and when I wanted to go there. Um, you could just get on a bus and go somewhere, and you didn't have to worry about trying to find parking. You didn't have to worry about traffic. And to me, that seemed the most ecological and economical way of getting around in the world um, and you still had sovereignty you still had autonomy over yourself well those human born rights are going away because the managerial class is totally changing the way transportation is transportation public transportation is the key tool for surveillance and so now I can see why so many people were against public transportation because if in the wrong hands it could be really detrimental to a human beings sovereignty and right to privacy so let's move on to the next section I mean I think Jeff we can't understate that enough men and women and folk people are getting up at three and four o'clock in the morning, leaving their children and their elderly and their partners, and they're opening up our shops, they're opening up um, our stations, and they're ensuring during this pandemic that, that we're on time, um, that we're moving. And BART, as you all know, and with the expansion, will be about 130 miles of track now going through five counties in two weeks. So she talks about how, you know, the, the working class and those people who need to use uh, transportation, um, 
you know, are very important to, to their vision. Uh, there's always, she's talking about expansion of tracks. So there's, you know, a couple of different transit agencies in this town hall. And the one is San Francisco Muni, which, you know, the classic famous cable cars, you know, all that. And then, of course, you've got your um, buses and your trains and your street cars. Um, that's Muni. And then BART is called Bay Area Rapid Transit. And so in this town hall, this woman here represents BART's vision for this post-COVID uh, public transportation world, the future of public transportation after COVID-19. Um, so she's doing this sort of feel-good language, like we have to really think about our workers who open up the shops, and we have to think about our, you know, people who really rely on public transportation and all that. So she is the, of the managerial class, she is probably the type of person that us poor folk and us underclasses would trust the most because she speaks that language of, you know, I understand you need public transportation. You still, you still do have an essential job to get to. Um, hey, look, she even mentions earlier on in the interview or in the town hall meeting that she took a couple of buses as a child growing up in San Francisco. But I would like to remind you that the managerial class are not of the class that you um, that you are in or that I'm in. They make um, at least six digits a year. There is probably at least a few people on this panel in this particular town hall that make over a million dollars a year. I'm sure I'm being conservative with that yearly salary. And, you know, they do not have the interest of the underclasses in mind. Do not be fooled. They are working in tandem with corporate interests. That is what sustainable development is. It is a combination of, it's just like what Michael Lind said, you know, the greatest threat to our democracy is this class, um, you know, is this managerial class, is what he said. I would suggest going and, and listening to this interview. The greatest threat to our democracy is this, you know, managerial class, not Trump, all right? So, because they're working on behalf of corporate interests. Um, okay, so let's move on. Um, there's another section in here, and then I'll probably leave it at that. Um, starts right about here. I want you to listen to this very carefully, and then I will interpret what is actually being said. And for you, um, uh, so if, Given what Jeff was talking about, that you have people who are concerned about, you know, maybe I, do I want to take transit now? Maybe I'll drive instead. Um, we so people who have the choice to drive instead of transit, some may shift to do that, um, and that could lead to further segregation and, and of our transportation uh, system, which can lead. To you know, create a lot of real challenges and inequities, and um, so I'm, I'm curious what your take is on how we, how could, what, what can we do? How can we avoid that? Um, how can we respond to that? Uh, and you know, make sure that transit is continues. To, it's a public good for everyone, and it works best when everyone's together. You know, that's that's a great question, and and you know, it's it falls into this trap that I'm a little worried we might fall into is, is we have these, these fears that transit ridership is, is going to fall, or we should say continue falling, right? For, for many of the systems, there's this, there's this desire to figure out for those folks who don't have a choice, how do we get them to realize that this is a viable mode of transportation, that it's still safe, that they should still be on it. And while I think that's important, I still think that when we're thinking about how are we, 
looking forward and how are we reimagining and revisioning the future, not just rebuilding, not just going back to normal, because we should all be starting from a place that normal wasn't good enough. Okay. So there's that term again, the new normal. Um, normal in the past wasn't good enough, she specifically says. And if you go back to what this guy said, he's basically saying, you know, and, and I'm not going to mince words here. This is what they do. This is what the managerial elite do. This is what the bourgeoisie do, is they assume that certain segments of the population will be falling all over themselves to take public transportation. In my case, they would be assuming correctly. I love public transportation. But there are people that I live around that have grown up in public housing, and it's their legacy. They've inherited poverty, and they're very proud of themselves for having a car and not being completely reliant on a bus service. And now they, they feel that their freedom is in their car. What these people are saying right here, and specifically in this conversation, in this portion of the town hall, is we're going to take away that choice. The goal is to take away that choice. And this is why it's called corporate fascism, because when choice is taken away, that means you lose your sovereignty, you lose your autonomy. Um, and, you know, it's all done in this really great feel-good language. You know, he talks about not wanting to abandon communities. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but the takeaway, your takeaway is supposed to be, wow, what a great guy. What a great senator. He doesn't want to abandon communities. He doesn't want communities to feel like they don't have an option, that they do have an option. And she, she's kind of a hard ass. And she's like, yeah, we need to clamp down hard and get these people to realize that this is the way it's going to be. This is the, the new fucking model. We're going to put everybody into these systems. We're going to do some major changes to the system. Um, lots of surveillance. She's not saying any of this, but this is what's going to happen in public transportation. And everybody is going to be on that human capital data grid, whether they like it or not. They're not going to have a choice. She used very extreme language there at the end. If you recall, you can go back and listen. She's like, it's time to, it's, it's time to get over the past and understand that this is the future. And that's what the, the term the new normal is all about. It's basically like, you know, you're no longer an autonomous human being with sovereignty and choice. You belong to the sustainable development slave grid models that are being implemented right now. And then further along in this video, um, more people do talk. Um, you know, more people do talk uh, in this, you know, this woman here with the glasses. She um, talks about um, simplification. Uh, so things like, oh, well, buying a train ticket should be as easy as getting a cup of coffee, you know. It's all this feel-good language, right? She talks about regionalization. She specifically gave Los Angeles as a model. She literally said Los Angeles had a system in place that was working for their demographic, but they've since come on board with this regionalization of transit systems. So you know, it's going to be you. So, so what you have to understand about this, that's so insidious is that if you're someone like me and you love public transportation and you don't even mind about like fare hikes and things like that, you're willing to pay more money to have the experience of having, um, of taking a train or a bus or whatever you're because you love public transportation. So I'm paying money to be mined. I'm paying money to be surveilled. I'm paying money to have my right to privacy excoriated and my sovereignty taken away from me. 
I'm paying money for a system that is forcing me into something that is not great. Um, so, you know, and chances are when, when, you know, this dude over here at the beginning talked about how, you know, it's this guy right here. We talked about how it's really necessary. Um, public transportation is like an absolute necessity. Um, you know, all of that absolute necessity is basically going to be, you know, complete and total control. It's only a certain amount of people will be allowed in each train car or each bus carriage. Um, you know, the mask thing and all this stuff, you know, that that is just making an experience that should be good and has always been really good, turning it into further oppression of your life. And so let's go, let's take it back home. This is the managerial elite that this guy was talking about and how the, the manager, he wrote the book on it, literally. And he explains that it's not Trump and crazy shit like that. It's, <laughs> it's these people with their feel good language and their really cool you know, avatars that are going to be implementing fascism, basically. Um, and you'll be okay with it because lots of Americans don't understand what words mean. They don't understand when they're being lied to. They don't understand when they're being told, oh, it's okay, just got on the train car and head over to that, you know, new place that we have for you. <laughs> you know, so you you know where I'm going with that. So, I, you know, and they don't even realize that that they're upholding sustainable development models, which are and they, that have you know interest only for the corporate um, sections of society and for the ruling class. So these are the bootlickers of the ruling class, these um, managerial class, you know. So I would say that. Open your eyes a little bit. Understand that there are models in every part of your life that are being put into place without your knowledge and without your input. And you certainly didn't vote for any of these people. You didn't vote for them to make these kinds of radical decisions, uh, which will greatly affect your life. Um, and it's not just transportation. Like I said before, it's public education. It's um, production of food, it's distribution of food, it's it's robotics and technology, and it's it's everything. It's absolutely everything. Um, and it's really um it's really something, the the transition that we're all experiencing. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. If you really like our work, you can help support us on a regular basis by going to patreon.com slash book of hours. For as little as $2 a month, you can sustain us and keep us working. You can also make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash book of hours. Thank you.